Hi, this is uh, Jim Ruff, and uh, I'm here with a, an old friend of mine, uh, Tom Jay. And uh, so uh, this show is going to be a little bit different than normal because I feel like I'm sharing a friend of mine um, with people. And uh, uh, Tom and I met on a ferry boat recently, and you were just coming back from a talk, and it kind of sparked me to, I wanted to know what was in the talk and wanted to know what was happening. and and thought maybe that this uh, show might be a good opportunity for others to hear also. So, um, uh, Tom, I, uh, I don't know how to, <laughs> let's start where we, where we finished. <laughs> oh, but first I think uh, one of the stories you were telling me about is that you have just participated in a book that's come out and you were it was quite an interesting story about how your book oh, right. came out. Yeah. So maybe you could kind of share that first. A way that the publishing, getting published, the, yes. easy, the easier the hard way to get published. Um, the um, actually the book's been out for a couple three years now. But the the way the way we got started was I got a call from a book designer um, Betty Watson from uh, the press that published the book, and she she called me up because I was a um, had done a lot of work with salmon and sculpted a lot of salmon images and stuff. And she thought that maybe I could do a graphic design for the um, for the book. And I told her, no, well, you know, I was one of those art students that never learned how to draw, and, and you really don't want to see my drawings because they're lousy, they're just sketches. And she, she insisted that she come out to the studio. So she came out to the studio and she looked at what little sketches I had from my work, and she said, you know, you're right, you really can't draw. <laughs> and I said, well, see. And, uh, but she said, you know, and we had a great conversation about salmon and, and what the book was about. And I, she said, well, you know, I have um, the, the writer that we've hired, I have his, um, his initial text, and if you'd like to read it, see where we're going with the book, um, I'll leave you a copy. So I said, hey, that's great, you know. Um, so I, I, as she left, I picked it up and said, well, I better pay attention to this and get it back to her, so I'll just read it real quick. And as I started to read it, um, I realized that this guy had plagiarized an earlier essay of mine called Salmon of the Heart, and he basically lifted whole sections out of it. So I called her up and I said, you know, uh, you got some problems here that you need to look at, and so I'll send you a copy of the essay and you can compare it to your text and see what's going on. And so I get a call back uh, the next day, and she says, you know, you're right, we've got a big problem here. Do you know anybody who could write the book? And I said, yeah, I know about five people who could write the book. So I gave her a list of five people, and I put my own name in there. And uh, so about a week and a half later, she called back and said, well, it's going to be you and Brad Matson, who's an old uh, guy who used to fish in Alaska and write for National Marine Fisheries. And we, we, were, we weren't acquainted at the time, but we became really close friends in the writing of the book. And... So that's how that's how you get to write a book. <laughs> otherwise, you would because yeah. I know you you wrote Salmon in the Heart, or I I mean I I read that you, I don't know, yeah. fifteen years yeah, ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Yeah, and I've since heard people talking about it in other venues. I've seen it referred to on the web, mm -hmm. and uh, so I, it's an art it's an article that really impacted a lot of people. It was published first in a in a book that. Um, Actually, kind of interesting. Uh, uh, local tree planters. Um, some some of my early mentors in in the environmental movement were um, Jerry Gorslin and uh, Finn Wilcox and Tim McNulty. And these guys were a tree planting co-op who who has, uh, also had a kind of an ethic about what it meant to be in a place. And so they uh, they had this um, environmental ethic they called reinhabitation, trying to become real inhabitants of where you are instead of being part of a, a culture that kind of floats above the place their ethos was to get into the place and uh, they published a little journal um, a periodic journal called Dalmoma which had writings poems things from local people who were trying to live this environmental reinhabitation ethic and actually we were trying to define it through our writing it was kind of a new thing um, and uh, so that's where Salmon of the Heart got published, and a lot of um, early reinhabitation poetry got published. And that that Dalmoma is uh, they don't publish anymore, but I think they're going to do a collected a collected issue of all the Dalmomas. That yeah, was marvelous. I remember yeah. seeing yeah. it uh, around town. Yeah, really, like, really, really well done, actually. I like this word reinhabiting, reinhabiting where we live. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I moved here from, uh, you know, suburbs, as you know, which mm -hmm. is not like living, you certainly don't inhabit a suburb. Mm -hmm. You just kind of, I don't know, you take walks through it, I think, mm -hmm. is what you do, or, or drive through it on your way. But um, it feels like um, inhabiting is something that you've done, I know, in, in the land that you've mm -hmm. built up. I should say, in, by way of introducing you to other people, um, I think you started, I think, the, the foundry, a, a bronze foundry, mm -hmm. um, the River Dog Foundry, and, and I know that you've had many incarnations around how that's going to, who's going to manage that and how mm -hmm. that works, but it's the oldest foundry in the Old, Northwest, I think. Yeah, the oldest foundry on the West Coast, actually. Now. On the West Coast, yeah. Yeah, yeah that whole re-inhabitation ethos is really interesting. The, it, actually, I have this great love of words, and one of the words that you know, I started to hear talking to these these uh, overeducated tree planters was uh, the word ecology, and I think most people think of ecology as a kind of scientific term. You know, that it it's a, it's a word that scientists use, and but if you look at it in terms of its roots, uh, it has two parts. It has the first part echo, and the last part logo, and they're actually. Um, anglicized old ancient Greek words and echo used to be oikos which meant house a very simple word for house and logos basically meant story so ecology is the story of the house mm -hmm. and so if you're gonna re-inhabit a place it means you become part of the story and you're part of the story inevitably but if you consciously choose to be part of the story then you will you'll start articulating relationships with with the, the original players the trees, the salmon, the creatures, the soils, the waters, and you'll make a, you'll make connections, articulate connections with those entities, and make the story more resonant, rather than what we tend to do is we tend to mine the story until it doesn't have meaning. We exhaust the story and move on. By by exhausting the story, you mean what we call development? Yeah, development. Or, yeah. Or, development or, or consumption or consumption. Yes. Whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, um, and it doesn't mean that doesn't mean that being part of the story means you're impoverished. It just means that you live within your means. Yes. And lives and you live within your meaning, too. There's a kind of a pun in there, but uh, yeah. So it's a it's a different kind of ethos. Uh, ironically, the word economics comes from the same Greek stem oikos, house, but nomos means uh, steward, so economics means counting the house. Uh, mm -hmm. And we seem to have convinced ourselves that somehow economy can contain ecology, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really work that way. It's, it, the, the, the house steward is basically a servant of the house. In the, in the imagination of language it is. In our imagination we think economy somehow can hold and contain ecology, but it, it, it's impossible. No, it works the other way. Works the other way around. We're, we yeah. have to be inside the ecology to have true economy. Yeah. So that's that's the reinhabitation ethos. Can kind of, kind of comes real clear in the, in the in the dynamic between those two words, at least in my imagination. Well, one of the emphases I know that you've taken on in in reinhabiting this place is that you've become aware and. Um, and have really taken on the salmon as mm -hmm. a as a symbol. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could tell a little bit of your story. How did that How did that come to you, or how did the salmon strike you? How did uh, it come to you? Yeah, that's that's. Well, as a as a child, I was um, I was a typical kind of um, American. You know, my father was um, my father was a person who was very ambitious, and uh, so as he worked his career. Every promotion he got, it meant we had to move, and uh, so that meant moving about every year. And uh, so all through my childhood, uh, we changed schools. I think I went to ten different schools before I graduated from high school. And in that process, I I, I, I learned one thing, and it was my secret. I said, you know, when I when I get control of my life, I'm not going to move. I'm going to stay put, mm -hmm. and because I hated it, go to a new school always meant you had to fight the bully or you had to you know figure out a new way of dressing or whatever it was it was the American um, kind of uh, sociology is, is a kind of a dynamic of popularity and prestige and mm 
being the new kid always meant terror. Trouble. I got good at it, you know. Mm -hmm. I could find the right guy to sure. take on or whatever it was, but that wasn't the kind of life I wanted. Um, so when I came here, it was a conscious decision that this was where we were going to live. And, and the way salmon came into the picture was um, I'd, I'd fished in Alaska for salmon, and I'd had an experience up there uh, that that kind of woke me up in, in, in one sense. It was just very simple. Uh, we, we caught a huge salmon one time, and, and as we, we couldn't gaff it with a hook the way you normally gaff, gaff salmon when you're on a troller, which is a boat that catches salmon with hooks. The skipper wanted me to net it, and as I came to net it, the fish was so big, it was a big, I think it was a female, it was about five feet long, probably weighed 100 pounds, and it just swam easily away from us, and then when I lunged for it, it just broke the line and disappeared. And it was the first time in my life I had kind of experienced something out of nature that was more powerful and great than I was. And it, it wasn't uh, such a, it was just something that's kind of like opens your mind, but you don't know what's going to come in. And so the next time I saw salmon was, I was walking in the moonlight uh, south of our place in this old orchard that has hoarfrost on it. I like to go there in the winter sometimes. And as I walked there, I heard the splashing in the creek. And so I went down to the cattle bridge, which is a place, the little place where the cattle could cross the creek. And I laid down on the bridge, and there up, coming up the stream was this coho salmon, this old, gnarly male coho salmon it, coming up in the dark. And it was you know, a very cagey old guy coming up at night when the bears weren't around, nobody could see it. It was coming home. And I just had this voice inside me say, that's your teacher. That's who's going to tell you where in the world you really are. And, and so I took it literally, and I accepted Salmon as a teacher. Um, and so I just became very curious about it, started reading about it and uh, trying to figure out restoration projects that we could do. And as it turned out, uh, my intuition or this... Uh, Whatever that is that tells you the right thing to do. I don't know if it's personal or if it's spiritual or whatever it is, but that thing, um, it turns out that the salmon are the keystone of the Northwest ecosystem. If you pull the salmon out, uh, the food chain falls apart, the forest nutrient cycle falls apart, and the landscape would be totally a different landscape if the salmon disappear. Hmm. Because they've co-evolved with this glaciated temperate forest landscape, and they've literally made it, and I could tell you more about that. But they've made the landscape. Made the landscape, yeah. So, so how, how are the salmon? I mean, how, how they're they our now? friends, yeah. What, they're, right now, they're, if they're the key to the mm -hmm. ecosystem mm -hmm. in the area, how do you think they're doing? Well, they're doing, they're doing very poorly. Um, you know, the, um, the two things we've done is that we, you know, native cultures, the traditional cultures here, learned that you, you had to harvest uh, salmon in a way that allowed them to uh, reproduce themselves. And so they had very ritualized and knowledgeable ways of maximizing their catch, but always ensuring that the runs spawned and got their eggs in the stream and continued. I mean, they, they understood that they weren't scientists, but they had cultural practices which ensured the runs would stay healthy. Even though they harvested tremendous amounts of fish, they didn't destroy the runs. Well, when we showed up, we did two things. First of all, we looked at the forest as a mine. We said, well, here, look at all this timber. We can, we, we mined the forest. And when you, when you clear cut and devastate whole sections of forest, what happens is the trees hold the topsoil and, uh, and buffer erosion. So the streams basically were at, at high water in the wintertime were, were torrents of destruction that wiped out salmon reds, that uh, brought sediment into the streams and choked off eggs. And then we started harvesting these fish, not just in the river mouse where you could actually count fish and discriminate your catch. We started harvesting them out at sea with gill nets and purse seines and an interception fishery which was totally indiscriminate. We didn't know which fish we were catching. See, the tribal people always knew which ones they were catching, so they could release. They, mm. could, they could let some through and say, oh, we've caught enough. And they knew what they were doing. We didn't do that for years. We also mined the salmon. And when we woke up, our answer was, 
not to uh, change our ways and start get, in, get, get back inside the story again. Our way was to say, well, we'll just have an economic scientific solution. We'll have hatcheries. Mm. And as it turned out, the hatcheries were a failure on a genetic level, were a failure on a, on a temporal level. Most of the hatchery fish, because hatchery managers always were nervous about getting enough eggs, would take the earliest fish. So they transformed the runs into a time frame where they didn't even fit the watersheds where they took the eggs from. See yeah. what I'm saying? By taking those early fish, the, it skews the run forward. And the fish always come in at a certain moment in the weather when the stream's either up or down or suits their purposes. The, the fish refract and reflect the dynamics of the watershed. They're a perfect manifestation of watershed dynamics. They're, they're an embodiment of whole watersheds. If you take a salmon's life history, it embodies the whole watershed cycle of that particular place. But if you start taking eggs just to produce salmon, you take them earlier and earlier and earlier over 50 years, then you let those fish go in the wild, they're not going to succeed because they're going to come in and spawn before the flood, their eggs will get washed out, whereas the natural salmon spawn after the first flood. You know, yeah. So it's, it's fits. So yeah. we've managed to basically push these guys to the edge of extinction in 100 years. And that's where we're at now. Now we're waking up, and the people who are waking up are the local communities. That's who have taken responsibility for the fish. The state is still, you know, good intentions, uh, not a lot of performance. Right. So people like point of view. people like you, and other places. At well, yeah, the all over, all over, all over the Northwest, uh, from from California to Alaska, there are neighborhood and community watershed groups that are forming and. In the best of circumstances, the state cooperates with them, and that happens quite often. The state has come around to supporting local groups, and they're getting better and better at it. And the, the local groups are actually the best people to um, do the restoration because they're in touch. Mm -hmm. They live right there, and mm -hmm. it's a learning thing for them. But once they get it, then it can be passed on. So this, is, so this has become kind of a mission for you, it seems like, is helping people to to inhabit the place through knowing and being in relationship to the salmon. Yeah, it's a, it's a, if, you, if you want to know where in the world you are, um, follow the salmon. Yeah. And, and they'll, they'll, t they'll teach you about food change. You'll get introduced to almost every creature in the watershed because almost every creature in the watershed eats salmon at some time, including elk and deer and critters you wouldn't expect. Mm -hmm. um, and if you take, if you take uh, borings from riparian zone trees, you'll find they're about 60% uh, marine carbon, literally built out of salmon. Wow. So it's interesting stuff like that. that oh. uh, and if, the, if you pull the salmon out, that nutrient budget that comes back to the stream every year disappears, and not in your lifetime or our children's lifetime, but our great 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 grandchildren, the forest composition will be a different, it'll be a different forest because the nutrient budget's not there. Mm -hmm. And we'll say, why don't we have fir trees anymore? Mm -hmm. Oh, huh, I don't know, you know. Well, it's because the salmon aren't bringing that nutrient back. So it's that simple and it's that complicated. <clears throat> so it's, um, it's a great way to, to come home. And Americans, you know, have, have this kind of spaceship mentality that they're living in this techno gizmo that is going to take them to salvation. But yeah. Somehow actually, we can technologically you know, solve somehow Somehow problem. we'll just stay in this bubble and float <clears throat> above the earth and... You know, it'll be fine, but actually what the salmon teach us is just uh, they're, the, they're the most generous species. They die, when they come back and die, they die, on a re die for a reason because they give themselves to the watershed because mm. that's the way it works here, mm -hmm. which is kind of curious. So when, so when you, uh, one of the things you're doing, or you've done, I know, is you built a huge salmon, right? No, no, actually that was done with the community. That was about 30 people. 30 people. That wasn't me at all. Oh, no. you didn't design that? No, nope. actually oh if, any, if anybody designed it, it was my wife, Ma. Well, yeah. She, she probably had more to do with the design than anybody, but the hands that went into it were, I was just Every, another pair of hands. Another pair of hands. Okay. Yeah. So the, then you created or founded with Ma uh, the Wild Olympic Salmon. Actually, that was Maul's idea, too. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, when it comes to wild Olympic salmon, I'm a, more of a worker bee. All right, well, let's, She's tell, them the about, idea person. let's tell them about Maul's 
current project yeah. with the salmon uh, art project. You mentioned you wanted yeah. to say something yeah. about that. Yeah, Maul's latest idea is this idea uh, called Soul Salmon, which is um, just one of her, another one of her great ideas is the is to have there's there's this um, always there's been a relationship between living in place and culture and art, right? Yes. And you know, art art means in our world, art means some kind of heroic expression. We always think of the artist as creative and heroic and you know expressive. But if you get down to the roots of the word, art all art means is joint. It means joinery, if you go back to the Latin root. So arthritis is based in the same root. Articulation is based in the same root. So what the artist does is make a, a, a formal set of joinery that allows energy to be passed from one awareness to another. Fundamentally, that's the artist's work, is to create joinery that allows transmission or transformation. So the idea here is we created a... Uh, image of salmon eight feet long, a male coho and a female coho. And what we do is we invite sponsors to uh, buy these fish and then hire artists to reinterpret them. Mm -hmm. You know, so the artist can take this fish, this archetypal 50,000 year old image, which is done very naturalistically in a blank form, and paint it up like a landscape, can paint it up like an old Chevy uh, dragster can put bits of mirror on it and reinterpret it to allow it to articulate something else or to create new forms of imagination around this critter. And at the end, some of these salmon, the way Maul envisions that these salmon will be put into an auction and the proceeds of the auction will either go back to the nonprofits who sponsored them or they'll go to salmon restoration projects. So in the end, some of the cities that have done similar projects have raised literally millions of dollars for this kind of stuff. And Port Townsend's been wonderfully responsive. We're going to have, we're going to have, I think, ten sole salmon in Port Townsend, all done by different artists. And you know, some of the bigger cities in the state have only taken ten salmon. So Port Townsend's really been great, <laughs> and that just speaks well for the for the community. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I remember. Uh, that really struck me was when your your shop burned down a number of years ago, and uh, the community you didn't have any. Uh, I, I know you no. didn't have any health insurance, you didn't have any fire insurance, <laughs> you didn't have anything. And I remember that the a huge number of artists and and people from the local communities and around yeah. the Northwest came together and and yeah. donated artworks yeah. and and eventually I think you essentially found out. That you and you did yeah. have yeah. insurance, only it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't the kind where you get a statement in the mail every month or a, an invoice in the mail every month. It's, it's the kind where you inhabit a place and then the place, kind of, knows you're there, I guess. And yeah, community, community is. Uh, community is another interesting word. It, it 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 comes it comes from two old words, co together and, munis, which means gift. And what we experienced in the foundry um, fire was that community based on that sense of things, mutual gifting, mutual obligation and promise is what the word really means in its heart. So if you're in a community, you're mutually obligated and mutually promised to each other. And you, you, you give your gift, you know, you have a gift of interviewing and yes. and perception. Uh. And so, so you give that to the community, uh, the camera people have, you know, their gift and they're giving it to the community um, and here I am you know I've got the gift of gab or whatever it is and I'm talking about words and all those things mesh and they make this this uh, thing called community which is sticky but articulate yes you know yes it, it's able to do things it's also able to get fractured and fight and do all kinds of other things right. but in its heart it's bound together yes. and so those people you know um, Terry Nomura, George Huntingford, I mean, he came and became the auctioneer, walked off the street, you know, he <laughs> walked in and saved the day because we didn't know how to auction things. <laughs> and he knew, he knew how to sell cows, oh, you know, that's so he, perfect. I mean, it was wonderful. So those kind of serendipitous things are part of that community stuff. Anyway, so it's, yeah, yeah. That, that was a great thing. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that 
the uh, camera people, because we've got Cliff Wood here, who's a published author, and he's donating his time, and Gary Lemons in the back room. Actually, he's paid, but he's sort of donating, because he yeah. kind of has that spirit about him. And yeah, community. He's an author, and, and Gary Nelson over here, uh, also donating his time, and, and uh, I just think it's a neat thing that, that yeah. we can uh, gather together and that's and, how it really uh, the works. Spirit, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but uh, what about so you inhabit a place, and salmon has been one tr one key piece for mm -hmm. you, and then your art and so forth has too. Mm -hmm. We only have a few minutes left, but what are what are some other clues about inhabiting a place? Well, the to me it, to me it, these words that we use to talk about things are are really. Are really, you know, words are just as alive in places as critters are. The language we use to describe our places is, <clears throat> those are words are words are sentient beings in a real way. I don't just mean sentimental about that, but so what what reinhabitation's about is creating a local culture, and and so my art basically tries to use the images that are inherent in the place. And just accept those as the limits in the terms of my expression. So I'll just stay in the image of salmon and raven and the forest, and I won't go outside of that. That's what I'll work inside of and accept the, accept the terms, the terms, uh -huh. you know, the language of the place, and say, okay, I'll talk in those terms. Yes. Rather than talk in some abstract terms or some speculative terms, I'll talk in those terms and, and rehearse the, those, those words. Culture. So you're letting the place dictate your art to you, in a way. Well, to, to accept, to use those terms to talk about the place, mm -hmm. to, to talk about the place in terms that it, that it, that are real. So, if you look at the word culture, culture means basically to turn over the soil. That's mm -hmm. what the it means at root sense. Cultivate your garden. Culture has the same root sense. But if you think about the poetics of the word. It means turning the ancestors who are in the soil, means turning them over into the light so they can bloom, mm. right? Gosh. So that's the real work of art, is to make culture. And that just means turning over the ancestors into the light so they can bloom. It's the old stories rehearsed again and again, brought into the present and, and, and renewed, because we rehearse them in our time, but they're old. Mm. And that's, that's the real work. Oh, Stay put cool. and make culture. Stay put and make culture. I think yeah. that's such a beautiful image. And I, believe it or not, we're out of time. I know you, yeah. I told you we would just yeah, get started right. when we had yeah, to end. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really glad that you could be here and that, and I'm hoping that this will be um, one of those experiences that contributes to the community's culture. Oh, yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So, but anyway, thank you, uh, Gary and Cliff and Gary. And um, and thank you, Tom, for for being Thanks, here. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's good. It's good. <laughs>